بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح المغفور وفاتح ما سبق ناس العقب الحق ولا هادي الأسرات في المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدر اللهم لما علمتنا إنك في العالم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وزد من فلك علم وتعلم إنك على كل شيء قدير الحمد لله والشكر لله It's a tremendous honor to be invited to be part of this gathering um, It always is alhamdulillah to be to have in our town here in Columbus to have a place like Masjid al-Rahmah uh, to be a, a source of nur in times uh, when times are good and when times are difficult alhamdulillah you know Mr. Rahmah the, the sky isn't falling in Mr. Rahmah when the sky is falling everywhere else and uh, thinking about today I was thinking about some things to mention uh, in the context of, of, of celebrating the, the coming to us to all of mankind and everything else the coming of and how we deal with things and because in the last few weeks it just seems like everyone Muslims feel like the sky is falling and we're entering this new phase of being Muslims in the West and especially young people are confused what do we do oh no what's going to happen now so you know alhamdulillah there's been a lot of talk recently about people's behavior is being affected by fake news, right? In social media, they see fake stories. People are on Facebook and Twitter and these internet all the time seeing all these stories and they affect people's behavior and affect people's minds and some of it is fake and they're just going with it and they say that affected the, did it affect the election and people are doing studies and government agencies are doing studies and, and we have a problem also though of the fake religion. Right? In, in this age of social media, in this age of shit, Google and fatwas that come left and right and don't have a basis in our deen, it don't have a, a respect for the, the breadth and the, you know, the intricate history and formulation of our sacred law. And people are just offering fatwas left and right and saying, well, hear this and do, let's do this, you know, we have to do this. And, and changing everything as we go along with the times. But alhamdulillah, when we have a place like at Masjid Rahmah, where, where we have scholars and people who respect our tradition and respect the Senate that comes along with Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah and have a you know, respect for the Sharia and not coming up with new Sharia every time something happens, every time there's something happens in the world and say, well, we have to, now we can do this and now everything's halal here and now, you know, and so we have this problem of, of uh, fake religion in our, where, where kids are getting their sources of, of deen now because they're always online, they're always on the internet seeing you know, new, new fatwas about this and that and uh, this is our religion, that's our religion. And so we have to cling to a, a place like uh, Masjid Rahman and, and places that are authentic places, authentic sources of our, our deen, of passing the traditional knowledge of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah uh, to the people, the youth, and everyone else, and everyone else. And to do that, we have to make sure we keep the guidance relevant, right? So when we do teach fiqh and when we teach uh, the the usul of our deen, we want to make sure that we're teaching it in a way that it's contextually relevant to the people we're teaching it. You know, if if teenagers are just hearing about things that took place a few hundred years ago or a thousand years ago and it's not affecting how they're approaching their daily life when they go to school, when they get home from school, when they have their social interactions with their friends and, and make their decisions throughout their life, it, it's going to be a problem. It's not going to hit home. It's not going to resonate. And so we have to teach the deen. We have to teach, uh, whether it's film or everything else, we have to teach it in a way that it's relevant to the audience that we're teaching to. Right? Because if, if, if people feel and young people feel that we're not talking about these situations they're encountering every day, but we're talking about situations people encountered in a place far away and in a time far away, 
it's not going to resonate with them, it's not going to hit home and, and have the effect that it should. And so we want to make sure that we keep uh, this pristine passing of the religion that takes place at Masjid Rahma, keep it uh, going, honoring the traditions as it always has, but also uh, relating it to our current times and our current situation and the current issues that everyone is dealing with when they uh, are in our society and in our time and place that we're in today. Uh, so that's the first thing I, I want to mention that came to me. Um, and we're entering in this, in this next phase for Muslims in the, in, in the West and especially in the United States where I think I talked a year ago at the Mawlid, we, we talked about civic engagement and in, in using the example of the Prophet ﷺ to insert ourselves into society all around us and show how he uh, acted towards people, etc., etc. And, and we need to take that even a step further to civil engagement, not just saying, okay, I'm here uh, and I want to take part in this process and I want to be part of Cub Scouts and I want to be part of uh, this election process, I want to be part of uh, the local, whatever, local community, Etc. But you, but not just doing that, but taking it a step further and, and being a part of it in a way that reflects the deen, uh, that shows how our human nature, the fitrah of the human being is the fitrah in Islam. The sunnah is to follow this. The, 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 the sunnah is in accordance with the fitrah, which is this humanity, which seems to be leaving people in recent times. You know, you see people, how they talk. People are speaking in, in rough ways. You know, we've seen uh, in the last few months and People are getting a rough edge about them. So we have to retain our humanity. You know, that the Prophet ﷺ, he showed us how to be human beings in reality, how to be uh, a mercy uh, to the people around us and not part of a problem and not an irritation uh, to the people around us. Right? He said, do not oppress or reciprocate oppression. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, love your brother as you love yourself. And he said, a believer is not he who goes to bed while his neighbor is hungry. Right? So these are the messages from our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So when we think of this, these messages, you know, it, 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 we, we realize the need for being this, this real, having this real human aspect to it. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts and we're going to do this and we're not going to do this. But rather we have this humanity uh, that we share with other human beings that when we have sohbah with other people around us, they should be affected by that, the softness of the hearts and the, uh, you know, the willingness to want to help and be, and be there for your, for your neighbors and your society and the people around you. And so this should be something people think of when they think of their Muslim neighbors. Right? And the uh, example of the Prophet وسلم, he, how he engaged uh, and he formed a whole, you know, a just society based on how he treated other people. And so the, the the default course of action that we have, the, the fitra nature, like I said, is in accordance with the sunnah. And so when, when we're acting along with the sunnah, we have this peace in our hearts. But when the society goes away from that, when the society contravenes the sunnah, this is where we don't tolerate it. But we don't, we don't stand up to it in a way that's angry or a way that's hostile and, and violent or something like this. We don't take to the streets and say, well, we... But rather, we do it in a way that says, you know, I'm, I'm going to pray. Like, let's say, for example, people have complained, well, now in, in modern times, I'm having trouble praying at work or at school or whatever because the climate is more hostile. We have to stand up for that in a way and explain gently and say, well, you know, we're Muslim and we pray certain times and this is what we're going to do. And we don't, we don't back down from that. But we do it in a way that's not angry with words that are venomous and hurtful because this is not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is not part of the fitra state of the human being. Right? The, the fitra state is, 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 is a gentle way of informing you. We stand up for our principles, our Islamic principle. We stand up for how the sunnah tells us to live. But we do it in a way that's very civil, in a way that, you know, where, that brings hearts together, not in a way that divides and, and tries to fight all the time. And so this is something to, to, to keep in mind. You know, when the Prophet وسلم, he came to Yathrib, right? It, it was called Yathrib, uh, from Faribah to Assault. The name of the city itself was this aggressive name. But then it became just known as Medina. So it's almost like naming it Medina was, it was as a way of saying we're going from this assault to just stand down. You know, everyone calm down. Everyone, you know, just relax and, and take it easy. And so, so I mean, this is, this was the, the when we see in the, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, this was the message of he, it calm, bringing hearts together and calming people down when they were fired up and wanting to 
be angry and, and have conflict. And so to do, to do that effectively, we have to master the language of social justice. We have to communicate in a way uh, where we can have civil disobedience if the sunnah is, is neglected, we can disobey what's going on in terms of abandoning the sunnah, but do it in a way that's civil and say, no, no, we're not going to tolerate that because our religion tells us this, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu tells us this, and so we're going to do it this way, and we're going to explain why, and we're going to do it in a, in a way that's, that's humane, you know, in a way that's civil, uh, to have respect for people, and we're not going to hurl alienating, alienating insults at people and just, uh, you know, tit for tat and and well, I saw this post on Facebook, so I'm going to reply with this post, and this will really get them this time because it's really sharp and witty, and this will really strike them where it hurts. And this is not from Islam. This is not from our, our Sunnah. Uh, so civil engagement, um, and, to, and, and but we we stick with it. We don't have despair, but we have hope in these times because in, in Islam, is our, our power comes from our religion, and our hope comes from our religion. And I want to relate a story that probably many of you know because I know. Have, many of you have connections or, or a love for the uh, Habaib in, in, in Tarim and in Hadramaut and uh, the, the story of uh, uh, Habib Muhammad bin Salim bin Hafid he uh, was the father of our, one of our great scholars today who you know Habib, Habib Omar bin Hafid and uh, when Hadramaut was taken over by the communists in Yemen Right? They wanted to extinguish, extinguish the light of Islam. And they, th they knew the way to do it, extinguish the light of Islam. The communists knew the way to do it was to extinguish the scholars. Right? To extinguish the ulama would be how to get rid of the light of Islam. And so this was their plan. And they even went as far to, as threatening and scaring and, and killing scholars uh, of Islam when the communists uh, took over Yemen and, and over in Hadramaut. And so, and especially they were, uh, they didn't have tolerance for the Ahlul Bayt because they knew that Ahlul Bayt had drew love to them and people loved to follow them. And so they, the communists, the, the scholars of the Ahlul Bayt uh, were threatened uh, by the communists constantly. And so Habib Muhammad, when he was away uh, at, at, uh, in, the, in the Hijaz, the, uh, he was the Mufti of Tarim. When he was away in the Hijaz, people warned him, they said, uh, they told, uh, they told him, uh, Salim al Hafid, they said, do not go back to uh, Tarim because the government there is watching you, the communists are watching you, you'll be in trouble, it's very dangerous for you. And, and what did he say? He said, uh, to become a Shaheed in Tarim is an honor I cannot turn down. So this was his approach. Uh, it was an honor to him to become a Shaheed. So he wasn't scared, he didn't say, well, now the government is this way or that way, so we have to change everything, we have to change our deen, change what we're teaching, all he was doing was calling to Islam. He wasn't plotting some big uh, military scheme or anything like that. He was calling people to Allah. He was calling people, he was a da'i, calling people to, a, to, to the sunnah and to follow, to worship Allah and to love Allah. And, and yet he was under this threat. And so what the communists did is they required him to check in twice every day because they figured if he twice checked in twice every day, that's too often where he couldn't go out to the villages and give his da'wah, call people to Allah. Uh, so they had... Uh, so they had him uh, check in twice each day, and then on one Juma, which was also the 29th of uh, Dhul Hijjah, he went to check in. Uh, he, he, something was different, so he, he actually he gave his rida, he gave his, his shawl uh, to his son, uh, Habib Omar. Uh, he, he, gave it, he gave him his, uh, you know, his, his shawl. His son was nine years old, so Habib Omar ibn Hafid was nine years old at that time. Uh, he gave him his shawl, and he, he went to check in, and he, and he never came back. And then years later, they... Uh, they found out that he was killed and he was thrown into a well and his body was mutilated. Uh, but yet his sons maintained the legacy of ilm. They maintained the, the legacy of, of, of passing on uh, the deen and carrying the, the nur of Islam. And his oldest son, Habib Mashur, he continued to hold on to this legacy of knowledge and this legacy of teaching. Uh, and so they were also in danger because the danger was passed on. Um, and, and, and in fact, the, the, the communists even came to his house and they said to uh, the oldest son, Habib Mashur, they said, uh, we're going to send you where your father is. And what did Habib Mashur say? He didn't say, well, I better back down or say, well, uh, okay, I'll stop. I'm not going to teach about Islam. I'm not going to, you know. It. But instead he said, uh, he said, I'm yearning to see my father. Take me to him now. You know, this was his approach. So and this was in a climate where uh, if you were seen with a book of fiqh in the streets, 
uh, you would be in big trouble, you'd be locked up and taken, but if you were, people could be walking around drunk and, and nothing would happen to them. But if they had a book of filk in the streets in Yemen in this time under the communist rule, uh, they would be in big trouble. So this is the climate they were in. Uh, and what do we see now? There's no sign of the communist leaders that were there now, right? Nobody even remembers them. So, so the, the deen has, has, the nur of the deen has preserved over the time because now everybody knows Habib Omar. Everybody knows uh, what Dar al Mustafa and the, and the, and the uh, religion that's passed on from, from this uh, place of ilm and the, and the sohba with uh, the habaib. Uh, you know, that takes place now, and, and, and it's, there's a resurgence in Yemen, there's a resurgence in Hadramaut, a resurgence in Tarim, of traditional of Islam, of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, uh, thanks to this uh, perseverance from, from this family uh, to keep this uh, deen. So we have to have hope and persevere. We don't just back down. The, the point of this is, you know, when, when there's an election or whatever the case may be, we don't say, well, we're going to change things and do things like this or like that. But rather, we, we persevere, but we do it in a, in a, in a, in a way of, of humanness and civility, right? So no matter how things look, uh, if, we, if we take the Prophet as our Imam, right, if he is our leader uh, in any time, those are the ones who are successful. The people who will have tawfiq are the people who say that uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is our uh, imam in, in our matters and, and, and this is our guidance. And, and, and those people will, will have success. Those will be the people of uh, Falah and these are the people who will uh, you know, uh, be, be standing at the end, not people who change things and say, well, I've got a new idea. Let's do the religion like this or like that. Um, so we persevere with hope. Uh, in this time where um, some people seem like they're, they're lacking hope. Abu Huraira, he said that the Prophet wasallam said, whoever is fearful sets out early, and whoever sets out early reaches their destination. Uh, truly the offering of Allah is precious. Truly Allah's offering is paradise. Okay, so the, the Prophet wasallam using this metaphor, talking about traveling, setting out and traveling. So what do you mean setting out early? Meaning in the depths of the night, right? The depths of the night, one of those times when it's Mubarak to worship Allah, right? It's in the depths of something of the, the depths of the night. Uh, and, and it requires preparation and foresight. Because it used to be people would travel as soon as Subh came in, right? The light would come in so you could see where you're going. So people would start to travel if they had a long distance to traverse. They would travel when, when Subh came in and they would set out. So people who want to travel early, who want to, who are, you know, concerned about what might befall them, or concerned about the enemy attacking them, whatever, if they want to set out early, it would have to be in the middle of the night, right? They set out in the depths of the night, towards the end of the night, before, you know, a little early, before Subh would come. But to do that, you have to have foresight, you have to plan, you have to know where you're going, because you can't see anything, right? Then. So you have to have a, a plan of attack, you have to know what you're doing, know where you're going, how you're going to do it, uh, so you're thinking ahead. Uh, and, and even in this hadith, when he, the Prophet ﷺ, when he said, whoever is fearful, but the scholars, the ulama have mentioned that fear is of two different kinds, right? There's, there's the fear of uh, worry, right? Where you're just worried. You're not, it's not a productive fear. You're just worried. All you do is occupy yourself with this worry, saying, oh no, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen? What if we do this? And this, this isn't going to work? And oh, we're in big trouble. There's nothing we can do. And then there's that's distinguished from concern, right? So another kind of fear is just having concern for something. Meaning it's a, it's a fear that, that causes you to think and say, well, how do we, uh, how do we approach this uh, difficulty? How do we approach this plan? So this is having concern. The Prophet was talking about you're having concern for uh, our journey. So we set out early, so we have concern for it uh, to reach our destination. Um, and so, uh, the, when we have this engagement with, with people, uh, whether it's political engagement or social engagement in our communities, uh, it has to be rooted in a spiritual concern. If it's just for the sake of politics and just being a part of it, you're not going to have tawfiq. It has to have something for Allah in it, right? Same with socializing. If we just socialize, well, anybody could do that. We could say, well, we're Muslims and I'm going to go out and party with my friends in school and uh, we're going to do this and go to this place and go to this haram. Well, anybody can do But if it's not for the sake of Allah, it's not going to have any barakah in what you're doing, it's just going to lead to more headaches, right? So that there has to be a spiritual component. We can't lose our ties to our dhikr of Allah and our, our reason for doing it for the sake of Allah when we go out and engage socially with people and engage politically in the processes of our community and our society. It has to be a, a spiritual basis for it. There has to be some dhikr uh, accompanying it. Otherwise, we'll just uh, encounter more problems, right? The, the person who keeps thinking about problems of this life they're going to be overwhelmed, 
right? But the more someone thinks about a law, the less the problems seem that impossible, right? The more one makes dhikr of Allah, their everyday problems don't seem as bad because they have, you know, hasbunallah wa ni'ma wakil. They, they trust in Allah and they, 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 they proceed forward. But someone who's not thinking about Allah just thinking, I have to do this and that, and now this is going to happen, and now what about this problem, and this is happening. You know, this person is going to feel overwhelmed and uh, because they're, brought, they're going away from Allah, not making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet sallallahu he uses in this hadith this travel as a metaphor uh, and, and if we're going to use travel as a metaphor, we should keep in mind one of the sunnahs of traveling is the musafir should travel in, in, uh, in a group, right? In a jama'ah of people who are, who are traveling. Uh, so I encourage everyone to strengthen their ties to their family because this, this next stage of Muslims in the West and in the United States is going to require us to uh, not be isolated but to go together, right? To be strengthen your ties to your, your brethren here, the ikhwan here, these are the people, the religious people are the ones that you want to have sohba with and have ties with so that it, it keeps your uh, iman at a certain point, not just isolate yourself in your own home and not keep up ties with your uh, your brother in Islam and the, and, the, and the people here at the masjid, but rather come to the jama'ah, come to the salah and, and keep up your ties with your family, your Muslim family, keep up ties and, and have some uh, point, a spiritual point to it. So even if it's just a tiny bit of, of dhikr that accompanies, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be just a whole much list of dhikr like we have here, for example, but even if you're just with your family and, and sprinkle in some type of dhikr with the gathering, uh, it, will, it will go a long way and your family will see, you know, it will keep everybody, you know, keeping Allah somewhere in people's minds uh, rather than just going about your business and thinking about your, your daily life uh, as it is without any deeper meaning, without thinking about what's coming, what we're approaching in the, in the after, in the, in the uh, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, etc. Uh, so as we proceed forward, we want to make sure our community here, our Muslim community and our community at Masjid Rahmah is founded on uh, first the knowledge of, the, that, of what the Prophet ﷺ has come with like we talked about, and so we keep on uh, presenting the knowledge of, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ gave us. So this is done, and this is done in the majalis here, uh, you know, about the Maghrib on often many nights and things like this, and, and, and there's someone, you know, a muallim sitting and, and presenting the knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ brought, and so this needs to continue for a healthy uh, community, a healthy Muslim community, and also accompanying that, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it needs both, both components, right? For a community to be strong, it has to have the knowledge as well as the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? It can't just be uh, one or the other, but, but both of these components need to be present uh, to proceed uh, in a way uh, and have hope uh, for tawfiq going forward. And so we have to have faith and we have to have righteous deeds and uh, call one another uh, to the truth. So call one another to doing good things uh, as well as, as doing good works ourselves and, and, and having, uh, keeping our iman. And so we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he was never overwhelmed by trials, right? He was always optimistic. He was the most optimistic of people, was the Prophet ﷺ. He never said, oh no, that's it, we're in trouble now. Never mind, it's, it's, it's over. But he was always optimistic, no matter what happened. Uh, he, you know, he said, whatever happens to the believer is good, right? This is good. Whatever happens to the believer. Uh, SubhanAllah, I mean, who, who says that? How many people say, well, whatever happens, this is good. Uh, but this is how the Prophet ﷺ was with everything, right? He's always optimistic. Uh, and he said, I have left you on the clear, wide way, so clear that its night is like its day. No one would veer from it except someone who ruins themselves. Right? So SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ gave us this huge path that we can easily uh, follow to success. Uh, and so we should take that opportunity uh, to follow that uh, you know, from this, this Bushra, from the, the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, so, and finally, uh, just to say, just to finish here, about you know the, the response to things we need to follow this example and of the Prophet ﷺ. and this is why we're here to celebrate uh, what he gave to us and he, he taught us how to combat dangerous language and we do it with speaking gently and proper discourse and not just speaking angrily back but speaking in a way uh, that brings hearts together right in the Quran we see the how did Firaun speak Firaun's the speech that we see recently it's not new Firaun he, Pharaoh has shown arrogance in the land the Quran tells us because he spoke from a high tower, right? He, he looked down on the people. He told them, we are great. So Firaun has shown arrogance in the land. 
divided its people into sects and groups and deemed one group to be weak and discarded them, right? So he's, he's creating sectarianism. So Firaun had this arrogance. He said, don't I have a kingdom in Egypt? Don't I have this? Don't I have that? He had this, this arrogance of Firaun. So this is what we see in some leaders today. Okay, so, so this is not new. He, he created sectarian division. This is also not new. Firaun, he plays on differences between people and the society. Right? The natural fitra of a people who have come from other countries, who have immigrated, a diverse society, is that they're going to blend together. You know, some people that came from Somalia, maybe they're used to eating Somali food, but their kids are going to eat more of other kinds. They're going to eat Chinese food. They're going to eat some of, you know, this food and that food and, and etc. They're going to have different tastes. They're going to have different... Because this is the fitra of how a society works when people come from different places and all mesh together. But Fidel tried to play on those differences and bring them back a couple hundred years and say, no, no, no. You know, these people are like this, the Bani Israel. Uh, we can disrespect them because they have no recourse. And so we see this in leaders today. This is what we see today, and it's, again, nothing new. Uh, so we have to, uh, by, by taking the course of action where we, we show that we have representation, we have power with our humanity, with our civility, uh, when people underestimate these basic capabilities like Firaun did to Bene Israel, even to the Prophet Musa, who is a prophet, saying he doesn't know how to talk, he did, just underestimating with pure arrogance the capabilities and potential of hu other human beings. Right? So we combat this discourse by calming people down, giving people hope, giving people trust, confidence, and get, reminding people that there's someone to turn to, and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the Prophet reminded us about. So we want to strengthen our relationship with our Lord, strengthen our relationship with our, our faith, with our deen. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't feel weak, don't feel sad, you are the higher ones, as long as you're believers. Right? So we are the higher, as, as long as people have iman and are of the mu'mineen, uh, these people, they're, they're going to be okay. There's no need to worry that we've sunk below some other people that are arrogant and declare, well, we're better than you. What basis do they have when we have the Qur'an? Right? This is not possible. So he says, we will make them imams, we will make them leaders. You know, so at times of difficulty, we want the best to come out of us and to be leaders in our response with something noble, uh, not with the, the kind of responses like we see from people in the media who are arrogant or angry and aggressive. Uh, you know... Is we will make them the ones who will inherit this land, right, is what's said. So we don't interpret the situation uh, as a fight with the society around us. We're not in a war with the people around us in our society, but rather we approach it, as we've mentioned. Uh, and in, in, the, in the West, keep in mind, there is a fitra aspect. If, you know, amazingly enough, the people in the West hate injustice more than anybody, anywhere else. In the Muslim countries, they become used to injustice, they, they tolerate injustice. But in the West, people hate injustice. People hate injustice, especially from the leaders. And actually, the day after the presidential election, I've never had so many people, non-Muslim, reach out to me and offer, you know, feel needs to offer condolences because they felt that Muslims were being disrespected. I had an eye doctor appointment the next day. He, he looked around, he said, I'm not allowed to say this, I really shouldn't say anything. But me and my wife, we were, we were so devastated by this election result. I just can't believe it. I just can't believe it. You know, I'm, I'm sitting in the eye doctor office. Well, this, this non-Muslim felt this need to reach out and say this to me. Uh, my uncle called in the middle of the night. He's not Muslim. He, he works for the government. He said he couldn't sleep because he was so upset with the election result. It just over and over. I've, and the, you know, there's uh, people came to Sunrise Academy and stood outside the Islamic school here in Columbus holding up signs saying you you belong here, you're welcome here. So I have story after show. These are just my own personal experiences. I mean, th these are going on all over. So this has provided a fat, an opening for people reaching out and it's creating relationships that we never imagined would even be there. So subhanAllah, this is, you know, uh, people plan but Allah is the best of planners. And so we see these opportunities now and we have to... Uh, capitalize on them and, and, and take them and it's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when one group is cornered it opens up an avenue of success somewhere else and we saw when the Quraysh when the Quraysh cornered the Prophet in, uh, in Hudaybiyah blocking all the means of communication between the Prophet and anyone who wanted to learn about Islam they thought we had him cornered but no, it was a great fat and it opened up Islam. And so this is the, a lesson we can take now in our times where we, people might think, oh, the Muslims are cornered in a this way and that way. But all of a sudden we have neighbors reaching out to us and wanting to know uh, how they can interact more with Muslims and we're developing these new relationships that we didn't have before. So we ask Allah for tawfiq in, 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 in spreading this, this nur of Islam and the way that the Prophet ﷺ uh, showed us uh, it should be done in this civil way 
uh, through through civil engagement and 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 with the in, 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 along with the proper knowledge uh, that comes through this chain, through the Senate, back to the Prophet ﷺ, and not what somebody just comes up with whatever they want to say and whatever they want to do. Nasr ba'afi wa tawfiq. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Fatiha.